Good morning and uh, thank you for joining class. Uh, uh, it's only two of you, but we'll still uh, go ahead and uh, begin class. We waited for some time for the others to join, but I think they will join uh, uh, after we begin. Okay, so we'll begin now. Can uh, Kiran, can you please lead us in prayer, Kiran? Yes, ma'am, sir. We'll pray. Father God, we come before your throne once again, Father God. Father God, we want to just say thanking you, Father God, for everything what you've done, Father God. Thanking you. Thanking you all promises. Thanking you, Father God, for new month, Father God, to new blessing, for new anointing, Father God. Thanking you. Father God, give your wisdom and knowledge, Father God, to the subject, Father God, that we can understand nicely and reveal more things, Father God, that can understand and that we, we can apply to our life and your kingdom work also, Father God. Thanking you. And those students willing to join, Father God, help them to, to join the classes. Thank you, Father God. Thank you. Almighty Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Uh, thank you, Kiran. Okay. Uh, so last class, we uh, last Wednesday, we completed Second Timothy. And uh, we looked at the introduction to uh, Titus. Um, uh, so today we will look at uh, chapter 1. Uh, we know that Paul wrote this letter to Titus. Um, Paul and Titus, uh, they go to Crete and they, uh, you know, they build the church up there. And uh, there's more work to be done. There's a lot of work to be done, things to be put into order in the church at Crete. So Paul uh, uh, leaves um Titus at Crete, and then he goes on to Macedonia. Um, uh, and maybe when he was in Macedonia, he receives a letter from Titus or he receives a report from Crete. And uh, he most likely wrote Titus uh, from uh, Macedonia. And Paul basically writes to him, uh, instructing him to put into order uh, the remaining matters in the church uh, at um, Crete. Okay. Uh, so we look at chapter one um, today. Uh, can one of you please, um, uh, I don't know if all of you can uh, read it because uh, you have, uh, Kanan, will you be able to read or it's not possible? I think Erin is having a connectivity issues, so she's going, joining Classly and it's uh, her connection is not too strong and she's left class again now. Kanan, is, can you read a few verses or it's not possible? You can type it in the chat section. Will you be able to read a few scripture passages? Yes, no. Okay, no response from Kannan. Uh, uh, Kiran, would you like to read uh, the whole uh, chapter one? Will it be possible for you to read or? Uh... Yes, ma'am. Okay. Okay, thank you. Yeah. It's okay. Uh, uh, Kannan has responded. So would you like to read uh, uh, a few verses as well, Kannan? Yes, no? Okay, so there's uh, basically, uh, third, I think there is uh, 16 uh, verses. So Kiran can read eight and then Kanan can read the rest eight. Yeah, go ahead, Kiran. Verses one to eight. Titus chapter one, verses one to eight. Chapter 1. Paul, uh, Paul, a uh, boast servant of God and apostle of Jesus Christ, according to the faith of God's elect and the acknowledgement of the truth which accord, accords with the goodness, godliness, godliness. In, godliness, in hope of eternal life, which God, who cannot lie, promised before time began, but has in due time manifest his word through the preaching which was committed to 
me according to the commandment of God our Savior. Two titles are true son in our common faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ our Savior. Go ahead till verse 8. Okay. For this is the reason left you in create. Sorry. Yes, right. For this reason, I left this, you in Crete. For this reason, I left you in Crete that you should sit in order the things that is lacking and appoint elders in every city as I commanded you. If a man is blameless, the husband of one wife, having faithful children, not accused of disease patients or is some insubordination as insubordination for a bishop must be blameless as a steward of God not self will not quick tempted not given to wine not violent not greedy for money but hospi hospitable a uh, lover of what is good Sober-minded, just holy, self-controlled. Thank you, Kiran. Uh, Kanan can read from verses 9 to 16. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, I will read. Verses uh, 9 to 16. Holding fast the faithful word as he has been taught that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and convict those who contradict. For there, there are many insubordinate, both idle talkers and uh, deceivers, especially those of the circumcision whose mouths must be stopped, who subvert uh, whole households teaching things which they ought not for the sake of dishonest gain. One of them, a prophet for their own, said, Satans are always liars, evil beasts, lazy uh, gluttons. This testimony is true. Therefore, rebuke them sharply that they may be uh, sound in the faith not giving heed to Jewish fables and uh, commandments of men who turn from the truth. To the pure, uh, all things are pure, but those uh, who are defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure. But even their mind and conscience are defiled. They, prof uh, they profess to know God, but in works they deny him being Abdo uh, abominable, disobedient, and disqualified for uh, every good work. Okay, thank you, uh, Kanan. Okay, so we look at uh, chapter one, uh, introduction and uh, greeting. Uh, Paul, a born servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, according to the faith of God's elect and the acknowledgement of the truth which accords with godliness in hope of eternal life, which God cannot lie, promised before time began. But as in due time manifested his word through preaching, which was committed to me according to the commandment of God, our Savior, to Titus, uh, a true son in our common faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior. So in verse 1, Paul, uh, you know, is uh, writing his own name first, uh, you know, and he's following the uh, letter writing customs of his day, where first the writer was mentioned, and then the reader, and then a greeting was given. So he was just following the letter writing customs of his day. So he's mentioning his name first, uh, Paul, and this letter was written to Titus, we all know that. Uh, it was not just written to Titus, but it was also written to the Christians um, or the believers or the church uh, on the island of Crete. Uh, 
And uh, Paul knew that this letter would be publicly read out among the churches uh, on this island. Uh, so in the opening uh, part of this letter, the first uh, line or first sentence of this letter, Paul takes great care to tell the Christians uh, of Crete what his credentials were or who he was and where he stood on important um, issues. Okay, So Paul calls himself as a bond servant of God. Now, what is the meaning of bond servant? Uh, why does Paul choose to call himself as bond servant is because he chooses the ancient word uh, doulos, okay? Uh, bond servant or servant is uh, the Greek word doulos. And this word not only uh, meant low slave, a slave who was very low, uh, in his, uh, you know, in his standing, his, in his social standing, it is also a word uh, that you know uh, it shows us that the, it, the person is a slave by choice. You know, in those days, nobody wanted to be slaves, but they were forced to be slaves. And when Paul is calling himself a born servant of God, he is basically saying, using the Greek word doulos, where he's talking about a slave who is very, very low in his standing, as it is slaves are very low, but here there's a lower standing, uh, and a slave by choice. So Paul is uh, choosing uh, to be a slave. Um, and a bond servant is one who is completely surrendered himself or themselves to the will or the authority of some of their master. Okay, so a bond servant is someone who chooses to be completely surrendered, totally under the control, the will or the authority of uh, uh, the you know uh, uh, of their master. So Paul chooses to be a slave who is totally surrendered to the will and the authority of God, okay? So he chooses this words very carefully and he says, I'm a bond servant means I made a choice to be a slave. To be a slave means to be under the will and the authority of uh, God. So even though a bond servant is a very low social standing, a slow place or position, but yet, uh, Paul, even though he chooses to be a bond servant, he says he has a high place uh, because uh, he's uh, why is his position high? Because he's a bond servant of God, and it's not a small thing or it's not a low thing uh, to you know to be under God, to be under this great and mighty God, to serve under Him, to be under His will and authority. It's never a low thing to be under God's sovereign rule, authority, reign, and under His will. And then Paul goes on to say that he is an apostle of Jesus Christ, and. Uh, he says, as an apostle of Jesus Christ, and Paul is saying that God gave uh, Paul this particular call and function of being an apostle. Okay. And uh, the word apostle in Greek, which is apostolos, means somebody who's sent with specific orders, uh, a delegate, an ambassador, somebody who's commissioned to do some specific role, assignment, task, a messenger. Uh, or it's also somebody who's called into the office of an apostle. So as an apostle, uh, Paul had God's authority. And as a bond servant, you know, uh, Paul is uh, talking about his personal relationship with God or to God. But as an apostle, he points out to his official responsibility uh, within the body of Christ. So he's here actually defining his uh, his uh, relationship with God when he says he's a bond servant. He's talking about his personal relationship with God. When he's talking about him being an apostle, he's talking about his official respons responsibility within the body of Christ. And he says he is Jesus Christ's apostle having been called, equipped, and sent forth 
as his authoritative messenger. So she's, he's laying all the basic, uh, you know, of who he is so that when he's writing and telling them what they're supposed to do, what they're not supposed to do, uh, he's going to give them certain commands. He's saying, this is the authority that I have received because God himself has made me an apostle, called me to the office of an apostle, and he has been called and equipped and sent forth as his authoritative messenger. So here we can see that God has given each one of us, uh, you know, different gifts. Some of us are called uh, to the office of teaching or some of us preaching or uh, to be evangelists, missionaries, uh, administrators, helpers in, the, in church as well. You know, whatever is our calling, whatever is our gifts, it is used for the mutual edification of the body of Christ. That means whether we are helping, whether we are... Um, uh, encouraging, whether we are prayer warriors, whatever, whether we're apostles or preachers or teachers or pastors, all of us together are edifying the body of Christ, edifying the believers in uh, who are called the body of Christ. And we're doing it for the glory of God. Um, so it's important that we discern the gifts uh, you know, that God has given to us, what are the gifts he's given to us, and what is the calling that he has placed on our lives, what is his purpose, um, uh, what is uh, the place of ministry which the master has called us, and we need to use our gifts accordingly, okay? So whatever is our gifts or the office God has called us to, we must remember to be completely surrendered to his will and his authority, just like Paul was, even though he was an apostle, called as an apostle, he says, I choose to be a bond servant. That means somebody who's totally under the Lord, the authority and the will of uh, God the Father. He says he's, uh, you know, he's a uh, bond servant of an apostle of Jesus Christ according to the faith of God's elect and the acknowledgement of the truth which accords with godliness. Okay, so according to the faith of God's elect uh, and no acknowledgement of the truth which accords with godliness, if you read the Passion Translation, it says, I'm writing you to further the faith of God's chosen ones and lead them to the full knowledge of the truth that leads to godliness. Now, I put this Passion Translation here because it helps us understand uh, the meaning of it. Okay, the Passion Translation helps us to understand that Paul is basically saying, I'm writing to you to further the faith of God's chosen ones and lead them to the full knowledge of the truth that leads to godliness. So here Paul is mentioning that his mission is to further the faith of those who are God's chosen ones, those who have acknowledged the truth, those who have accepted Jesus Christ as their personal savior, and they've acknowledged the truth that is in keeping with godliness. And he says, God's, according to faith of God's elect, God's elect are those who God chose before the foundations of the world to receive his salvation, which means that God did not, uh, he's not a partial God. He did not choose some for salvation, some for damnation, some for uh, salvation and some to end up in hell. No, it's God's good, pleasing and perfect will. We learned in First Timothy that all men be saved and come to the knowledge of uh, Christ Jesus. Uh, but when we say that uh, God chose us before him in the foundation of the world is he knew who are the people who are going to make the choice of salvation. And we know that God in his sovereignty has given us the free will to choose. So we choose whether we want uh, salvation or we want to accept God or reject God. So those who have chosen uh, have already been uh, you know, they have, uh, 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 God knew that they would choose uh, salvation even before the foundations of the world. Okay, that means even before the world was created. But those who must exercise personal faith prompted and empowered by the Holy Spirit. So even as we have accepted Christ Jesus as our personal savior, we do it exercising our personal faith and this has a personal faith and also being uh, this has been empowered by the Holy 
uh, Spirit. It's the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. We know it's the work of the Holy Spirit to convict the sinner of sin, righteousness, and judgment. Okay, so we can ident. So once we accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, we identify with God's elect because they responded to the gospel of Jesus Christ and lived their lives after that gospel. So we live our lives which accords with godliness. So the aim of God's truth is to promote godliness in God's people. Uh, that's what God's word does. It brings about correction, sanctification, godliness in us. So Paul's ministry and mission here, he says, as an apostle is to preach and teach the gospel to build up the body of Christ and to establish churches sound in the faith and in the knowledge of truth. So now why is he saying this? Because he knows this letter will be read to the people at Crete and they will question his authority. So he's saying he's chosen by God as an apostle and it is his responsibility, his God-given authority and responsibility to teach the gospel, build the body of Christ, establish churches in the sound faith and the knowledge of truth. And uh, he's writing this because he's trying to establish the people at Crete, the churches at Crete, the believers at Crete in the sound uh, knowledge of the truth. Okay, And we also know that the, we also learn from this that this should be the mission and the purpose of the church today. The mission and the purpose of the church is to preach and teach the gospel, to uh, edify the body of Christ, build up the body of Christ, and establish uh, the church in the doctrines of sound faith and in the knowledge of the truth. So our need is to promote growth and development, uh, development of mature faith in God's chosen ones, uh, through them growing in the knowledge of the truth. Verse 2, Paul says, in hope of eternal life, which God cannot, who cannot lie, uh, promised before time began. So Paul states that his ministry and apostleship is in the interest of, uh, of the faith of God's chosen ones and their knowledge of the truth and also promotes godliness uh, and this godliness rests on the hope of eternal life. Now hope here is not something that uh, we just wish or something uh, that we just hope for will come true but hope here, the Greek word for hope here means a confident expectation and anticipation. So it's a confident expectation because it rests on the promises of God uh, who does not lie uh, and uh, uh, who go, uh, uh, it rests on the promises of God who not only does not lie but cannot because of his perfect and holy character. So God uh, cannot lie and his, uh, uh, you know, he cannot lie on the promises that he has made. And uh, also God cannot lie because he's perfect and his character is perfect and holy. Now, here it talks about uh, the eternal life, hope um, uh, of eternal life. So we know that eternal life is something that all of us as believers will possess one day. Uh, but it's not something that it's eschatological way in the future, but it is a realized eschatology. That means something that we can experience uh, right now, right at the moment when we have accepted Jesus as a person, say that the minute we are born again, the rest of our lives, we can taste and experience the blessings of eternal life here and now. And it's not just way in the uh, future. And we know this through scripture in John chapter 3, verse 36, that, prom that uh, Jesus promises us, the one who believes in the Son uh, has eternal life. That means already possesses eternal life. It does not say those who believe in the Son will have eternal life. It says those who believe in the Son has. That means we already possess the eternal life. We experience eternal life here and now. And this eternal life is... Uh, one which God who cannot lie. So there are two points here the apostle is making, uh, which is the reality or the truth of God and his eternal nature of his promises. So the here is we, we learn the truth about God that he cannot lie because he's perfectly holy and righteous. And the eternal nature of his promises that God cannot go back on his promises. He will fulfill his uh, promises and cannot lie, the Greek word means free from falsehood, 
uh, or it's used as uh, not guilty of falsehood but truthful so god's nature by himself is uh, you know he, he cannot lie his truth uh, and also we know that his promises that he has made is uh, perfectly true he cannot go back on his promises okay any doubts so far are you all able to understand what i'm saying yes no okay so the eternal promises that god makes uh, has made you know um it's not something or the eternal life that god has promised is not something that he made a last minute decision on the spot uh you know after adam and eve uh, sinned and uh, you know it's recorded for us in genesis chapter 3 uh but we see that this promise of eternal life goes back to eternity past okay uh and we know this uh, as we read this in verse 3 but he says but as in due time manifested his word uh or if you look at even verse 2 if you just go back to verse 2 which says here that the hope of eternal life which god who cannot lie promised before time began so the uh, the promise of eternal life god did not just make in genesis chapter 3 after Adam and Eve sin he did not just decide on the spot or he just didn't think and make a decision but this is something that he um decided before eternity uh, passed and was three it says that um, you know but as in due time manifested his word through preaching which was committed to me according to the commandment of God our savior so while it, uh, the plan of salvation uh the plan of eternal life was kind of settled in in the mind of god was already in his plan in eternity past even before the foundation of the world and even the lamb that was slain uh was uh, you know we read in revelation chapter 13 was 8 uh, the lamb being slain from the foundation of the world that means uh that even before the foundation of the of the world uh the jesus is uh, you know sacrifice the full sufficient perfect sacrifice that he would be making uh in history at a point of time was already a completed thing was already a done thing in the ma- in the mind of god god had already seen it completed okay even before the foundations of the world even before it took place in history it was a conceived thing in the heart and the mind of god and was also completed done thing in the heart and the mind of uh god so but even though it was a completing even before the foundation of the world but the proclamation of this message was made known in god's own time according to his own purpose so we see that God created the world and how sin came in and how he brought in prophets and judges and everyone and then he sent his uh, son so um, the even though it was decided and completed thing in the heart and mind of God but it uh, God took his uh, God's own time to bring about this uh, and fulfill his purpose right here in history okay uh so we see that old testament uh you know uh there was an anticipation of the salvation message it was spoken to the prophets and uh, it was also portrayed to the tabernacle the priesthood the sacrifices all spoke of christ coming uh spoke about christ's life his death his resurrection uh and the message has only not only been made evident by these historical events but it is it is also for us to preach and teach this truth this completed uh, work of salvation on the cross by jesus and the plan of god uh, to people okay and uh, so paul is saying that uh, you know it was uh, in due time god even though it will happen in eternity past uh, in due time god manifested his word uh, through the preaching which was committed to me according to the commandment of god our savior so he says you know um uh, it's a right time for me to preach all of this because when christianity came into the world it was possible 
to spread this message firstly because there was a common language uh, Greek was a common language. Secondly, the Roman Empire, you know, uh, uh, was very, uh, very vast. Um, you know, um, uh, Roman Empire spread through almost uh, most parts of the world. And so it was easy. Uh, travel was very easy. Uh, and also the world was looking for a Messiah and a Savior. And uh, so we see that it was a, it was a good time for uh, the salvation message to be. Preached. And Paul knew that preaching is a way, uh, you know, that God's eternal work uh, can be shared to people of today. Uh, and preaching is one way where God's word is, uh, can be made manifest, that means can be made evident. Okay. And he says, this preaching is committed to me. And he says, Paul saw this preaching or this uh, message of the good news of the gospel uh, and its proclamation as a treasure, which was entrusted to him, which was give it to, given to him. Uh, the, the, the word Greek word committed here means uh, to have faith, to entrust. So the meaning here is to be entrusted with something. That means Paul says he has privilege, not only the privilege, but also the responsibility of proclaiming the uh, message. And so also we believers have, uh, you know, not only the privilege of knowing the resurrected Christ of what he's done on the cross for us, the benefits of the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross, but we also have the responsibility to proclaim this message, to speak about the wonderful benefits of the cross, the wonderful benefits of what Jesus did on the cross with people. Okay. Uh, and so the preaching of God's word is committed to all believers. Okay. So here in Titus, uh, uh, the, the letter to Titus, the apostle uh, uh, becomes an example to Titus and to Cretans and to us, you know, that uh, we are to preach uh, the gospel. We are uh, to share the message of this risen God, the risen Christ and what he's, did on the what he's done on the cross. Uh, share this message because it has been given to us as a deposit, as a safekeeping not something to be hidden away, not something to be cherished as a treasure which we can hold dear for our lives, uh, you know, uh, and keep it in a safe deposit, like so to say in a box, but it is supposed to be shared out with others, okay? Um, so this God-given trust is, or uh, this God-given treasure of this message is for us to proclaim the message um, and it's not something that is like a take or leave it matter for the Christians. Uh, Paul had no option. Uh, he had to preach the gospel and he preached it to the very end of his life. And it's not also an option for us. And we also see that in the Great Commission, uh, you know, we are entrusted with this command uh, to preach and teach and baptize in the name of the Father, Son and Holy Spirit. And uh, Paul ends this verse 3 by saying, God our Savior, uh, which is an uh, awesome title of God as a Savior God, uh, where one that stresses the very heart and the nature of God. Uh, he's a God who is concerned with man's salvation, uh, salvation from sins, penalty, power, and ultimately from its presence. Verse 4, he says, uh, To Titus, a true son in our common faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So we see that Titus, he calls Titus as a son, uh, somebody who he let, uh, uh, Paul led Titus to, to, to Christ, to salvation, to accept Christ as his personal savior. He also mentored him and also helped him grow spiritually and uh, appointed him for the sa service of serving his uh, uh, master, okay? And uh, so he says, uh, a true son in their common faith. So it's Paul and Titus had a, fa a father-son relationship because of their uh, common faith, okay? So here we see that this word common reminds us of that which we hold common with all believers. Uh, that is our personal faith in our Savior, uh, which binds us all together as a spiritual family, uh, regardless of our nationality, our status, or even uh, our doctrines, as important as that is to the Christian 
community. Okay. So all of us have been entrusted, uh, how all of us who have trusted the Lord Jesus, uh, you know, we are uh, brothers and sisters in Christ. Um, uh, we have one Father, one God. We are all his children. Um, and this uh, provides us uh, the basis for harmony and communion. Then he talks about grace, mercy, and peace. Now, what is common about this uh, three words, grace, com uh, mercy, and peace? Anyone knows grace, mercy, and peace? We see that Paul uh, typically uses this as his greeting uh, in most of his letters, grace, mercy, and uh, peace. And we see that he never changes the order also of these blessings. Uh, first, it's grace. What is grace? What is grace? on class anyone can answer what is grace what is grace yes thank you prince it's god's favor uh, it's God's unmerited favor. That means we don't deserve it, but it just, God gives it to us. It's a gift uh, from God. Okay. Um, and this is, we know it's, uh, we see this uh, uh, in the person and the character of Jesus Christ. And then it's peace. Okay. Uh, we know that peace is portrayed. Uh, yes, grace is something given freely by God. Peace is uh, uh, various the portrayed in various ways in the New Testament, uh, and we receive peace of God only after we put our faith uh, uh, in uh, the person in the completed work of Jesus. That means when we have accepted Jesus as our person Savior, uh, we believe what He has done for us on the cross. We confess with our mouths. It's only then can we basically receive uh, the peace of God. So after one has responded by faith uh, to the grace of God as revealed in Christ Jesus, we receive the peace. So that's why he uses grace first. Then he talks about mercy and peace. And then he says grace, mercy and peace from God, the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, when he uses these words, God, the Father and Lord Jesus Christ, he's not just using it as a formality uh, because uh, Paul knew that uh, the source of all grace and peace, uh, mercy and peace is only from God and uh, from uh, God the Father and from Jesus Christ. Okay. And in all of his epistle greetings, Paul teaches us that there can be uh, neither grace nor peace without our personal relationship with God the Father. So even if you're born again and if you don't, uh, you know, uh, uh, experience peace, you know, it's because uh, somewhere you have, uh, you know, uh, uh, are not abiding in the wine, you are not intimately connected with uh, God, you're not, uh, you know, one in your relationship with God. So what is essential to receive uh, peace and uh, grace and mercy is one's re relationship with God the Father and with God the Son uh, because he's our savior and with God the Holy um, Spirit, okay? Then he talks about, in verses uh, 5 to 9, he talks about the qualification of elders. Now, uh, did we read this elsewhere? Does Paul write this also to someone? And did we study about this qualification of elders? Who does Paul write to? About the qualification of elders? In the church? Where else did we read it? Do 
you all remember where paul writes so to who does he write about uh, qualification of elders how to choose elders about how to appoint elders in the churches who does he write to thank you kiran he writes to uh, timothy uh, thank you aren uh, yes he writes to timothy uh, uh, and he tells them how to he tells him uh, explains to him how to choose elders and uh, bishops okay so in verses 5 to verse 9 he's talking about qualification of uh, elders and so in verse 5 he says for this reason i left you in crete that you should set in order the things that are lacking and appoint elders in every city as i commanded you so it says for this reason i left you in crete paul left titus in crete uh, to build a mature stable church uh, with qualified pastors for the people and this there was this the there was especially this need in crete because uh, we we saw or we heard in the introduction that the people at crete were a wild bunch uh, who were known as uh, lazy uh, people and liars and uh, so titus had to find and train capable leaders for the christian or the for the churches in the island of crete and paul tells him set in order you should set in order the greek word for order here means uh, straighten further uh, to correct in addition and that means uh, you know straighten further what has already been set what has already been done we know that paul and titus uh, began the work at uh, crete and titus was to continue this work here uh, because paul had to leave um, and um, uh you know and he did not want to leave them without anyone to oversee or help them uh but paul had to leave crete but he decided to leave uh, titus behind uh so that you know it will not be like uh, they are just giving birth to a child and uh, you know uh, caring for the child for a little while and then abandoning it on their own uh left at someone else's uh, here uh, paul did not want to do it because these were all the churches at crete were his own children but he had what he had established and built uh, and hence he did not want to leave them as orphans in the hands of others uh, so he left titus there and so titus had to preach and teach them so that they can grow spiritually and uh, he needed to appoint uh, godly leaders to build uh, those who were uh, uh you know immature or babies in their uh, faith and so he had to set in thing thing uh in crete the things that are lacking now if we compare the work of titus in crete and the work of timothy in ephesus uh, it shows that there was much more lacking uh among the congregations at crete uh and hence paul had to specifically tell titus to set in order things that are lacking and we see that he does not give any such command to timothy so he tells uh, titus appoint elders and we learned in timothy uh when we we read about the same qualification of elders in timothy uh you know that um, uh, elders bishops uh, pastors or presbyters were all uh Uh, terms that are used interchangeably and basically meant to those who provided spiritual leadership and so paul is saying that timothy uh, titus you can't choose elders based on uh, vote popular vote of people uh, you had or uh, you cannot choose elders based on how they promote themselves but it's your job uh, to look for uh, men of uh, this kind of character and he lists out the characteristics um and then he says appoint them as leaders in the um, congregation okay um now a local church uh, or a congregation of believers uh, is defective if it lacks qualified elders or qualified spiritual leaders or qualified pastors okay so uh the reason here is uh, why he wants titus to choose is because god has chosen this office of elders and he has chosen their function what they have to do of shepherding the care uh, uh, of the flock that god has entrusted to them and uh, you know in order to uh, continue the process of spiritual growth so it's very important to choose the right kind of 
uh, leaders. And so he says, choose leaders in every city. That means uh, Crete was uh, famous for having many cities and it, uh, Titus had a big job at hand here. And he says, uh, I command you. That means Paul is giving him the authority, the instructions uh, to appoint leaders. Um, and it was his responsibility to carry it out. And then he gives out um, uh, the qualifications for elders in verses 6 to 9. Uh, we'll take a break here and then we'll come back after the break and we we'll look at uh, the qualifications. <laughs> 